Okay, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, I would like to welcome you to the third lecture in our 2021 lecture series entitled Fighting for Soul, Religion and Spirituality in Barbados. This evening, Mr. Achai Adams will be talking to us about emancipatory religions, Quakers, Methodism, and Moravians in pre-emancipation Barbados. We will also be joined by Robert Kamabach, who will be chairing the lecture. A reminder of our housekeeping rules, um, all comments and conversations must be placed in the chat. Any questions from Mr. Adams at the end of his lecture must be placed in the Q&A feature which will be found at the bottom of your screen. And as a courtesy, all participants will be muted. Um, I will now hand over to Mr. Robert Kamabach, who will then um, introduce Mr. Adams. So, Mr. Kamabach. Thank you, ma'am. And good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to this, the third lecture, as you heard, uh, Emancipatory Religions, Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians in pre-emancipation Barbados, quite a mouthful. I'm a Methodist, um, and uh, around this time, we Methodists tend to get pretty excited. Um, he wrote today because it's here on Gill, so when I saw this, I was especially um, interested to hear what um, Master Thierry has to say to us this evening. I had a conversation with him, and um, he had some interesting ideas. I've already written down some questions for him at the end. And I entreat you to do the same as he goes through the lecture. But first, something about Mr. Adams. Achiri Adams is an educator of significance with over 25 years experience at both the primary and secondary levels in Barbados, and is currently the head of the general studies department at the Court and Paris School. He earned a BA with honors uh, at UWE, at Cafield campus in both English and history, and an LLB, again with honors, uh, from Huddersfield uh, University, and, and is at present a graduate student at the Department of History and Philosophy at Cave Hill. We expect honors will come there also. Achiri is a qualified teacher and has a diploma in education, as well as a postgraduate diploma in educational leadership with merit, what we used to call CERTEG from Erdeston Teachers Training College. He served as a member of the, and secretary of the church council of the St. James Parish Church and has a keen interest in Barbadian, Caribbean and African history. Well, um, with all of that to say, I'm looking forward to hear what he has to tell us this evening as I'm sure you are. So without no much further ado, over. To Mr. Chiri Adams. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamabach, for that gracious introduction. <laughs> I have a problem. You can mute me a second. Pleasant good evening to all of you. I wish to thank the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, and especially Dr. Henderson Carter for the opportunity to deliver this lecture. It is an honor and I am deeply humbled. I will also like to salute those persons who have over the years encouraged and inspired me to immerse myself in the fascinating study of the past. I'm therefore compelled to publicly thank Mr. Victor Jackman, Mrs. Lorraine Clement, Dr. Rodney Worrell, Mr. Martin Ramsey, and Mr. Alwyn Adams. My topic this evening is emancipatory religions, Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians in pre-emancipation Barbados. <clears throat> 
The Cambridge Dictionary defines the word emancipatory as follows, giving people social or political freedom or rights. I will begin to frame this evening's discussion by sharing an anecdote which provides an interesting backdrop. I am a teacher of Caribbean history at the secondary level. And one of the main themes in the syllabus is Caribbean slavery and economy. When I point out to students that Christians in Barbados and other plantation colonies enslaved Africans, and that many slave owners were devout Christians, there is usually some pushback. I then go on to explain to my students that you need to examine the context in which people lived to understand their actions. Invariably, after my long spiel, many students remain unconvinced. And I vividly remember one of my top students adamantly saying, sir, you can't be a Christian and own slaves. Let us be clear at the outset. Members of the Quaker, Methodist, and Moravian faiths in pre-emancipation Barbados enslaved Africans and condoned slavery. That is incontrovertible. Anne Gill, our sole national heroine and matriarch of the local Methodist church is amongst this number. However, the knotty and emotive issue of Christianity and slavery during the period under review is not cut and dried. For some members of these faiths fervently evangelized the enslaved, advocated for emancipation, and in some instances, manumitted their enslaved workers. To this end, some scholars have argued that nonconformist Christian denominations like the Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians provided the impetus for an organized anti-slavery movement in Britain. This is what I consider the first blow or germination argument. Needless to say, there are contending views on this topic. Christianity and slavery in the Atlantic world is a complicated, nuanced, and emotive subject. In the problem of Western slavery, in the problem of slavery in Western culture, Davis suggests that Christian theology, along with Western culture in general, has been riddled by ambivalence and ambiguity over the nature and morality of slavery. James Walvin, in Slavery, the Slave Trade, and the Churches, speaks to the troubling and painful issue of Christian involvement in the slave system. He eloquently charges the historian to confront the awkward historical realities of the past. Have we in Barbados confronted these awkward realities? Or has incisive analysis and debate on these matters been largely relegated to the state world of academe? My remit this evening is to critically assess the extent to which these faiths can be deemed emancipatory in the Barbadian context. In conducting the research, I sought to identify if the leadership or hierarchy of these churches had enunciated a codified policy or creed on enslavement. In addition, I reviewed the activity of the missionaries on the ground, as well as some of those converted to these faiths to gauge if they were largely quiescent to the slave system or had pursued a radical emancipatory agenda. The time frame under immediate study spans some 179 years, from 1655, when the first Quaker missionaries visited Barbados, to 1834, when the Emancipation Act came into force. Let us briefly examine the genesis of Western Christians' involvement in the enslavement of Africans. Adil, in his expansive work, The Popes, the Catholic Church, and the Transatlantic Enslavement of Black Africans, details how the papacy legitimized Portuguese and Spanish slave trading by issuing a number of papal bulls. For example, the Ilias Qui, 1442, the Dum Diversus, 1452, and the Romanus Pontificus, 1455. Of particular interest to this discussion is the fact that these papal bulls were issued to facilitate cruising 
crusading and to further European economic interests. I wish to stress upon the economic nexus between the Catholic Church and the emergent slave-based New World plantation economy. This model or paradigm of church or Bible sanctioned enslavement normalized the slave trade and the enslavement of Africans to the faithful. Over succeeding centuries in the Atlantic world, papists, Protestants, and Puritans alike, to varying degrees, adhere to the core philosophy of this paradigm, black enslavement and white overlordship. The dominant church in Barbados in the pre-emancipation era was the Anglican church, commonly referred to as the planter's church. Its leadership fully embraced enslavement and white supremacy. Right Reverend Anglican cleric, Bill B. Porteous, Bishop of London, in 1784, strenuously argued that enslaved Africans had an absolute incapacity of the mind to receive or comprehend or retain religious truths. In the early 1820s, Reverend William Hart urged the enslaved in St. Lucy to be content with their lot and even suggested that enslavement was a blessing. They quote William Hart. However fatiguing it may sometimes be to your bodies, take my word for it that you have reason to thank your heavenly father for giving you so much employment and work, that you have no time for listening to the temptations of the devil. Notice how notions of black inferiority were intertwined with pro-enslavement interpretations of the scriptures. These two examples preface my central argument this evening, which holds that the religious zeal and egalitarian rhetoric of the Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians in pre-emancipation Barbados was sublimated or modified due to anti-African racism and the economic exigencies of the plantation model. Let us now focus on the Quakers. The Society of Friends or Quakers was a Protestant Christian sect started by George Fox in the 1650s. Fox was born in Drayton in the Clay in England and was uneducated. Quaker tradition holds that Fox received a vision from God while standing on Pendle Hill, mandating him to focus on the inner light and the ability of all people to receive the love of God. The Appalachian Quaker stems from a judge ridiculing Fox's claim to tremble at the word of the Lord. He thus referred to Fox and his followers as Quakers. Various scholars have deemed Fox to be an iconoclastic leader. The Church of England, however, regarded his dissenting views as heterodox and the authorities imprisoned him on eight occasions for his religious beliefs. Fox and his converts did not practice traditional forms of worship. They rebuffed the need for ordained ministers and believed anyone could be moved spiritually to preach the word. In addition, Fox and his followers refused to swear oaths, pay tithes, or provide military service. The early Quaker faith was in many ways anti-establishment and radical. What the Quakers had in common with some other Christian denominations was the zeal to evangelize or convince others to join their faith. Early Quaker missionaries used the Christian soldier motif to describe themselves as spiritually weaponed and armed men going forth to fight and conquer all nations and bring them to the nation of God. Ernest Taylor's Valiant Sixty, also known as the first publishers of truth, were a collective of early Quaker traveling preachers who avidly spread Quaker religious doctrines or the pure and genuine principles of Christianity in their original simplicity. Mary Fisher is listed as a member of this collective and it is Fisher and Anne Austin who are credited with spreading Quakerism to Barbados in 1655. 
These two itinerant Quakers met with some success in Barbados, with Fisher informing her friends in a letter. Here is many convinced and many desire to know the way. On their second visit to Barbados, Fisher and Austin convinced two of Barbados's leading planters, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Rue and his son John Rue, and the faith spread in the island with some rapidity. Quaker Henry Fell arrived in Barbados in 1656 and reported, many people convinced of the truth and were meeting in three several places in Ye Island. Historical records indicate that after the initial foray by Fisher and Austin, dozens of Quaker missionaries visited Barbados and the island was referred to in Quaker writings as the nursery of truth. The approximate number of Quakers resident in Barbados in the 17th century varies according to source. However, Larry Gregg posits that by the 1680s, there were over 1,000 Quakers in a population of 20,000. In the 1680 census, Quakers accounted for 6% of the population. The Quakers and slavery. Let us now delve into the historical record of Quakers and enslavement in Barbados. In 1657, George Fox called for the conversion of African slaves and Native Americans, citing the golden rule and stating that God hath made all nations of one blood. His words were not heeded by the Quaker community in Barbados en masse. A review of the voluminous Quaker, Quaker records indicates that until Fox visited Barbados, Quaker missionaries stationed here did not frontly condemn the enslavement of Africans. In 1671, at age 47, Fox, accompanied by five members of the Valiant 60, spent three months in Barbados and, um, and observed enslavement firsthand. At this time, according to Brathwaite, there were five Quaker meetings and hundreds of Quakers. Please note that at no time during his trip or after did Fox condemn the slave trade or enslavement. On the contrary, his thoroughly ambiguous middle of the road statements on enslavement have been interpreted by some historians as tacit approval. The most notable being his gospel family order, which was a sermon ironically given at Halton Plantation, home of prominent planter Thomas Rue. In this sermon, Fox recommended freeing slaves after an indeterminable term of faithful service and suggested that they be compensated upon being manumitted. He advocated that Quakers worship with their enslaved workers, teach them Christian principles, but did not advocate for emancipation. Larry Ingalls summarizes Fox's apparent incongruity thus. Fox's thought reflected a maturing of the slave culture and acceptance of a new view that no contradiction existed between Christianity and slaveholding. Hence, Christians might hold slaves, at least for the time being, and that time always retreating into an indefinite tomorrow. Historians generally conclude that Fox believed that evangelizing the enslaved would make them more subservient and malleable to the will of their white masters. What can explain the dissonance between Quaker theology and how they treated to enslavement? 17th century Barbados has been described as a frontier society in which European colonists of all religious persuasions sought to make their fortunes. The mechanics of plantation Barbados required exploitation of labor as a business model. In practice and in theory, the oppressive master-servant or master-slave paradigm was recognized as economically, socially, and theologically permissible. Quakers in Barbados were fully integrated into this milieu of avarice and oppression, which was further reinforced with biblical justifications for enslavement. Thus, 
Quakers in Barbados willfully participated in the slave trade and chattel slavery. As Dave and Brian Davis opines, the prosperity of Quaker communities in the New World depended to a large extent on slave labor in the Caribbean. Catherine Gerdner, who has conducted extensive research on the Quaker community, notes that when Quaker leader George Fox visited Barbados in 1671, only four Quakers did not own slaves. A variety of scholars, for example, Dunn, Morris, Cummins, Block, etc., have sifted through the archival data and have identified widespread Quaker slave ownership in Barbados. Notably, when Quaker leader George Fox visited Barbados in 1671, he resided at the house of prominent Quaker Lewis Morris, who had amassed some 400 acres and owned over 200 slaves. What empirical evidence have researchers culled from the extensive Quaker records in pre-emancipation Barbados that would burnish their emancipatory or anti-slavery credentials? In a nutshell, precious little. Analysis of manumission records and Quaker wills by Kristen Block reveal that the rate of Quaker manumissions are only marginally higher than the non-Quaker slave owning population. Notwithstanding the generally small proportion of manumissions in Barbadian society as a whole, the vast majority of Quakers bequeathed their enslaved workers to their next of kin. They did not manumit them. There were Quakers, however, who condemned slavery in Barbados as unbiblical and inimical to Quaker inner light theology. William Edmondson, Benjamin Lay, and Alice Curran stridently called for the emancipation of the enslaved and their Christianization. Edmondson made two visits to Barbados, and whilst here, he vehemently argued that enslavement was incompatible with Quaker theology. In addition, a number of Barbadian Quakers, like Ralph Fretwell, suffered heavy fines when they repeatedly broke the law by taking their enslaved to meetings. These examples, however, are outliers and not indicative of the Quaker body politic in Barbados. The enslavement of Africans was a fundamental component of Quaker wealth and prosperity. Thus, the majority of Quakers in Barbados rejected the tangible emancipation of their enslaved workers. Quakers in Barbados intended to change the heathen ways of their enslaved workers by exposing them to the principles of Christianity. In Capitalism and Slavery, Williams writes that some 84 Quakers were listed as members of the company traded to Africa, among them members of the Barclay and Bering families. I fully agree with his terse summation, which is fully applicable in the Barbadian context. Quaker nonconformity did not extend to the slave trade. Let us now take a look at the Methodists. The inward witness, son, the inward witness, that is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. These are the words John Wesley's dying father, Samuel, spoke to his son, John. These words became an enduring feature of Methodism, a faith which originated during the tumult of the 18th century evangelical revival in Britain also referred to as the first great awakening. John Wesley, a former Church of England minister, is the acknowledged founder of Methodism. He challenged the religious orthodoxy and spiritual torpor of the Church of England. However, Methodism only became a separate Christian den denomination after Wesley's death in 1791. On June 11th, 1739, John Wesley famously declared, I look upon the world as my parish. This statement typified the ethos that was central to the growth and expansion of the Methodist faith. Methodist missionaries in the British Caribbean 
enthusiastically preached their version of the gospel to the enslaved as they believed that all men, including slaves, were brothers in Christ and equal with whites in the sight of God. While this may have been the theological foundation of the Methodist ministry in the Caribbean, in slave societies, there were limits to this egalitarianism. In practice, Methodism trafficked and reinforced notions of white European supremacy, as well as the distinctions between masters and the enslaved. Methodism was first introduced in Barbados on 4th December 1788, when Reverend Dr. Thomas Cope, the father of Methodist missions, visited the island accompanied by Robert Gamble, Matthew Lunn, and Benjamin Pierce. Dr. Koch subsequently visited Barbados on three occasions, but it was Pierce who remained after that first voyage to build and open the first Methodist church on the 16th of August, 1789. Due to the reticence of the established church and the planters on the issue of converting the enslaved, Dr. Koch concluded that the Negroes of Barbados are much less prepared for the reception of genuine religion than those of any other island in the West Indies. Methodism as an emancipatory religion in Barbados. Statistical evidence indicates that in the first decades of its existence in Barbados, Methodism's growth in relation to the number of congregants was slow. By 1812, they had achieved a membership of only 30. Scholars suggest that a confluence of factors explain this tepid growth. I shall focus on the chief among these, which was the perception that Methodists were anti-slavery protagonists. Beckel suggests that Methodist principles of spiritual brotherhood and equality under the fatherhood of God were anathema to the agenda of local oligarchs. Planters were unanimous in the belief that Methodist missionaries who ministered to the enslaved as brothers in Christ were a threat to the social order. Olivic suggests that the planters rejected the view that an enslaved Christian would be a better worker and more docile. Many of them believed that conversion of the enslaved would tend to erode their sense of inferiority and embolden them to challenge their enslavement. In essence, they felt that the work of the missionaries could imperil their way of life. There was immediate tension between the established social order in Barbados and the struggling Methodist mission. The source of planter hostility can be partially traced to Methodist church father John Wesley's 1774 anti-slavery tract, Thoughts on Slavery, as well as the formation of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade on the 22nd of May, 1787. Methodist missionaries in Barbados were suspected to be agents of this new society. Planters believed that Methodists were in league with the anti-slavery society and they felt that their Christianizing efforts could inflame the passions of the enslaved. Anti-Methodist sentiment pervaded the white community and Pierce, writing from Bridgetown before opening the first Methodist church, stated that the planters published me in the newspapers in a dreadful manner and threatened behind my back what they will do if the impudent madman should build his chapel. Hoyos indicates that planter hostility towards the Methodists prevented them from vigorous, vigorously proselytizing the rural plantations and forced them to confine their activities almost entirely to Bridgetown alone. Methodism in Barbados therefore faced the arduous task of simultaneously ministering to the enslaved while seeking to allay the fears of the planters who were suspicious of their intentions. Despite their careful balancing act, Methodists in Barbados encountered hostility, persecution, and violence, which reached its apex with the orchestrated attacks on Reverend Shrewsbury and the violent destruction of the Methodist chapel 
1823. Reverend Shrewsbury opposed slavery, so much so that he and his wife renounced any entitlement to her father's wealth because he had accumulated it as a result of enslavement. While this may be deemed admirable, it is noteworthy that in some of his writings, Shrewsbury expresses classic anti-African tropes, and I shall provide two examples. Here is Shrewsbury speaking about the enslaved. Little superior to the beasts that perish, the only end they seem to answer in creation is to prove how deeply man has fallen by sin. Here's a second quotation from Shrewsbury. As it regards the moral condition of the slaves, that is nearly the same. Polygamy, adult adultery, fornication, blasphemies, thefts, lying, quarreling, and drunkenness. These are the crimes to which they, the generality of them are more or less addicted. They live and die like beasts of the earth, for no man careth for their souls. Did Methodist missionaries in Barbados advocate emancipation? No, they did not. According to Cobley in Anne Gill, the making of a Barbadian national hero, Methodist missionaries saw it as their religious duty to uphold all legally constituted authority, including the authority of slave master. In addition, he cites the fact that Shrewsbury, who diligently condemned what he deemed to be immoral, never publicly challenged or denounced the system of slavery. Even if Methodist missionaries wished to condemn slavery, they were officially proscribed from doing so by the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society or WMMS. The WMMS was the supervisory evangelical body of the Methodist church. And here I will read one of their instructions. You are not to engage in politics or otherwise become involved in public controversy while in the field. Methodist missionaries in Barbados and elsewhere in the Caribbean had strict rules of conduct to follow. They were prevented from going to visit the slaves on any plantation without the permission of the owner or manager nor are the times which you appoint for religious services to interfere with their owner's employ. The chief work of Methodism in Barbados in the pre-emancipation era was to bring the Christian gospel to the enslaved. In this, they achieved limited success. Methodist records list a total of 122 enslaved converts on the eve of emancipation in 1833. Juxtapose this with the fact that some 83,000 enslaved Barbadians were emancipated in 1838. While Methodists were at the forefront of anti-slavery agitation in Britain, in pre-emancipation Barbados, they tried to navigate within the plantation system unobtrusively. The Moravians. The Church of the United Brethren, Unitas Fratrum, or Moravian Church, according to their published history, is the oldest evangelical church of the modern era and dates from March 1st, 1457. Followers of Czech reformer John Huss, who was martyred on July 6, 1415, began the sect in Bohemia and Moravia. In 1620, when Protestantism was overthrown in Bohemia, Bishop John Amos, Cominius, and other members fled to Moravia. Around 1722, this group settled in Saxony on the estate of Count Nicholas Zinzendorf, a wealthy Lutheran nobleman. Religious scholars note that the adherents to the Moravian doctrine were influenced by German pietism, which emphasized personal discipline and faith. The Moravians under the leadership of its patron Zinzendorf aggressively embarked on the conversion of enslaved in the Caribbean. 
Furley states that their mission to the Caribbean was solely focused on the enslaved population. They initiated their missionary campaign in the Dutch Caribbean island of St. Thomas before expanding to the British West Indies. Please note that on the island of St. Thomas, Frederick Dober, whom Zinzendorf called the apostle of the Negroes, bought a small plantation which was worked with slave labor for the support of the brethren. Moravianism in Barbados began in 1765. On the 9th of May, two Moravian missionaries, Andrew Ritzmansberger and John Wood, left Hernhut, Saxony, and arrived in Bridgetown on the 26th of September. These Moravian pioneers endeavored to buy or rent property in Bridgetown, but were unsuccessful. Mr. Jackman, a Quaker of Jackman's estate, allowed Ritzmansberger and John Wood to preach to the slaves from the veranda of his home. They continued their evangelism by preaching to the enslaved at Lairs, Exchange, Applewitz, and Grandview plantations. The early Moravian mission eventually purchased land in the vicinity of Edgehill and Arthur's seat, St. Thomas, now called Sheeran, 1795, and attracted enslaved workers from Yorkshire Hall, Dunscombe, and Mount Wilton. Cyril Aldersley in the Moravians, two centuries of work in Barbados, writes that the early Moravian mission received a hostile welcome from some of the enslaved. And he writes that bad characters among the, among the slaves abused them and poured scorn upon them and broke up their meetings. Hutton explains that the first decades of the Moravian mission in Barbados was beset by the frequent deaths of its pioneer missionaries. Govaya posits that the fledgling church struggled to keep alive at the end of the 18th century. The Moravians and slavery, the divine institution. The Moravian church had a rigid hierarchy which meticulously managed the affairs of the church worldwide. This fact is critical to understanding how the Moravian mission in Barbados acted with regard to the institution of enslavement. The evangelical ethos and missionary governance model was a classic top-down model. Let us therefore begin at the top. Count Zinzendorf called slavery the divine institution. According to Kingsley Lewis, Zinzendorf did not entertain notions of emancipation for the slaves upon conversion. He did not see an incompatibility between Christianity and slavery. Hence, as Williams opines, the Moravian missionaries in the islands held slaves without hesitation. Now let us ruminate upon the words of Zinzendorf himself. Here is an, an extract from an address he made in St. Thomas in February, 1739. God punished the first Negroes by making them slaves and your conversion will make you free, not from the control of your masters, but simply from your wicked habits and thoughts and all that makes you dissatisfied with your lot. Fealty and obedience to those in authority was a fundamental doctrine of the Moravian church fathers. The establishment and growth of the Moravian mission in Barbados during the slave era is an outgrowth of these core principles. Count Zinzendorf writing to a Moravian missionary cautioned him that he was not to work against the police or regard the government with suspicion. Do not interfere between employer and employed. Do not play any part in party politics but teach the heathen by your example to fear God and honor the king. Sheridan opines, the Moravians accepted slavery, owned plantations, and abstained from interference in civil affairs. Their complacence with the established social order enabled them to ingratiate themselves with the ruling planter merchant elite in Barbados. Beckles notes that Barbadian slave owners 
viewed Moravian evangelism among the enslaved as ideologically compatible with their interests as they stressed obedience to social superiors. The Moravian mission in Barbados was chiefly concerned with dampening the heathenish propensities of the enslaved majority and reinforcing the racial and economic status quo. Thompson suggests that it was a source of conceit and a powerful testimony on behalf of the mission that during the 1816 war of General Bussell, no enslaved Moravian converts were implicated in any way in the disorder. Moravian slaves on Mount Tabor Plantation were freed on June 20th, 1834, instead of August 1st, the official date for emancipation. Outside of this notable fact, it is difficult to find any evidence to suggest that the Moravian church advocated for the emancipation of the enslaved in Barbados. In 1825, they did embark upon educating the Negroes with classes for enslaved adults and children. Education of the enslaved reflexively would have been opposed by the ruling elites. However, as Kingly Lewis suggests, education came to be seen as a means of social containment by the ruling class. And the Moravian missionaries were often used unsuspectingly as agents in the policy of social containment. Conclusion. Handler refers to pre-emancipation Barbados as the quintessential slave society. Christian missionaries who entered this space had to confront an establishment that viewed the evangelization of the enslaved as inherently dangerous. A number of societal factors hampered the extent to which Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians could evangelize the enslaved. Among these were a relatively homogenous society, oppressive laws, and persecution, as well as the attitudes of the enslaved themselves to conversion. My task, however, was to examine whether these denominations were emancipatory or could be deemed so within the context of an entrenched and economically viable slave system. There is a paucity of evidence to support any notion that they were indeed emancipatory. What I found particularly ironic was the obsession of the missionaries with the souls of the enslaved and not their bodies. Farquhar estimates this apparent illogic aptly. No matter how vicious the brutalities of the slave system, it was the African who needed to be brought to the knowledge of the gospel. What do these missionaries emphasize when converting the enslaved in Barbados? Quaker, Methodist, and Moravian missionaries emphasized submission as a key tenet of Christianity when evangelizing the enslaved. Submission to your master and submission to the state. Govay in her seminal work, Slave Society in the British Leeward Islands, argues that in doing so, the missionaries were helping to perpetuate the maintenance of the slave system and the slave society. A second tenet of their evangelization was what Green terms moral imperialism. That is, the wide-scale imposition of British middle-class Christian ideals upon enslaved converts. As a descendant of ensla enslaved Africans, it was sobering to confront the fact that members of these three denominations considered Africans or Negroes to be a benighted, licentious, depraved, and savage people. The Quaker, Methodist, and Moravian churches therefore sought to civilize these heathens by bestowing European Christian religious doctrines and standards of morality. Komarov, in examining the work of European Christian missionaries, perceptively characterized them as vanguards of colonialism. In Barbados, there is a clever saying which enca encapsulates dissonance of word and action. Your morning and evening words don't greet. 
ministering to the souls of the enslaved and subtly advocating for them to be better treated is not championing emancipation. Moravians and Methodists continued to own slaves in Barbados until Emancipation Day was practically upon them. Quakers steadfastly maintain slave ownership as well. I find little comfort in the argument that these religious denominations struck any blow for emancipation in Barbados during the period under study, or that they significantly impacted the emotional, social, and intellectual space in which enslaved Barbadians lived, bled, and died. After reviewing dozens of scholarly texts, online articles, theses, and the like, I find myself agreeing with Williams's terse analysis of missionary activity in the pre-emancipation era, and I quote, the attitude of the churchman was the attitude of the layman. Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians in Barbados owned slaves. Through their actions, they condoned and perpetuated a plantation economy sustained by the economic exploitation of enslaved labor and racial tyranny. The historical record does not suggest that they can be deemed emancipatory in the fullest sense of the word. Sir, you can't be a Christian and own slaves. Thank you for your time and patience. I um I paused a bit actually. Um, I must confess that I was impressed. I was impressed because you have done your research. I have not seen much of personal input based on your feelings here or based on what you think may happen. Um, you have uh, mentioned several sources from which you got your information. So it was well researched. I thought your presentation, I don't know if I'm being a bit forward here before uh, coming on to the end, uh, clear and articulate. Um, as a Methodist myself, I found it rather disturbing because I must say I held some a, a different view, totally unsub unsubstantiated um, by research, of course, merely uh, the feeling going forward. So you have certainly enlightened us as to how things were um, back then. I, I note your conclusion was based, again, not on any personal inclination. Indeed, you are um, a member of the church council of the James Street Parish Church, so you're not anti-Christian in any way, you simply presented the facts as you saw them. Um, I also welcome the insight, that is, um, how the different religions came to be, came to being, um, the, the, the Methodists, the Quakers, etc. well researched. Again, I paused because um, I, I, I'm waiting to hear questions from others. We're just giving persons a few minutes to just submit any questions that they have. Um, okay. I know that you said you had a question lined up for Mr. Adams. I don't know if you want to start the ball rolling. Well, Mr. Adams did his research concerning Barbados, and Barbados seemed to be a hotbed for slavery. Mm -hmm. um, did you get the feeling that? Um, did you get the feeling that other Caribbean islands? Um, had a similar um, a, a similar approach and attitude uh, with respect to um, uh, moving towards emancipation, that it was not different than Barbados, but Barbados a hotbed. Um, Bar Barbados stands out because um, Barbados, as Professor Beckles has described, was the original slave society, so to speak. 
um, due to the fact that we would have had the sugar revolution taking place here and uh, the model that would have been used after sugar became entrenched in Barbados would have been um, exported, so to speak, um, to other regions. Um, as it relates to the missionaries in other Caribbean islands, um, the pattern is similar to what would have occurred in Barbados. Um, if you take a look at Jamaica, well, they would have had the Baptists, which I didn't focus on here, but um, generally you have a situation where you have a, a rigid hierarchical church structure um, based in Europe, and then you have the missionaries who go out into the field, so to speak, to carry out their work. And in terms of the Methodists and the Moravians in particular, um, their missionaries were proscribed officially um, in, in documents and so on. They were prevented from actually going against the dictates of the state. They were supposed to respect all lawfully constituted authority and uh, seeing that they were suspected in general by many of the planters, um, their leadership tried to ensure that they did not stir up controversy by being um, pro-slavery, et cetera. So in many of the other islands, you see some of the same um, <coughs> continuities that you see uh, in Barbados. Yeah. I pause, to see, I pause to see if there's any other questions. We have a comment here um, in our chat from Marcia Nurse. Um, she says, truthful presentation from start to end. Church of England, Judaism, Quakers, Methodists, and Moravians all supported the enslavement of enslaved Africans and enslaved Barbadians. The spiritual mores of that period laid the foundation for their post-emancipation approach to non-white. Um, thank you very much for that comment. Can I share my screen a minute, please? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. right I just want to back up what was said um, as it relates to that comment, and I'll just bring up on the screen here. You will see slavery not inconsistent with Christianity. And this was a sermon preached at the St. Lucie Parish Church by Reverend William Marshall, a very colorful character. Um, he himself, I would say, eventually became um, an abolitionist. But if you can take a look here, you will see that in the parish church itself, he was actually preaching that there is no incompatibility with slavery and Christianity. And you also have here a list. And at the very bottom, his name is here because he received compensation for owning slaves. All right, this same Reverend William Marshall, very colorful character. Thank you for that comment. Okay, we have a question from David Gibbs on Facebook. He says, based on your findings, can the Methodist Church in Barbados, in all good conscience, promote Sarah Ann Gill as a national hero, or should they ask for her removal? Well, um, thank you for the question. Very interesting, very um, provocative. Um, obviously, if we are scrutinizing all of our national heroes, we will find that there are some elements of their lives which may throw out red flags, especially if we are focusing or examining it from a modern perspective. Um, the idea of a national hero um, owning slaves um, to some people is immediately a disqualifier. Um, however, if we take a look at her total life in terms of her commitment to Methodism, in terms of the sacrifice that she made, um, then in some people's minds, that offsets the fact that she would have um, had an enslaved workers. Um, bear in mind that um, some of her enslaved workers would have been bequeathed to her by her husband. But that doesn't negate the fact that she did have enslaved workers. And uh, um, for some persons, um, 
that is something that they aren't really, um, they aren't readily able to um, discount. Um, but I, I, I guess um, when the committee who had examined the persons who were selected, um, the various choices, they would have examined all of these details and they would have decided that her contribution was so significant that she did deserve um, a status as national heroine. Okay, we have another question from Sarah, from Sandra, sorry. Um, did you come across a report by a Moravian clergy that Barbadian blacks would not receive would not receive black locally trained clergy? No, I did not come across that in my research. Um, if you're willing to um, inform me about it, I guess I could um, check up on it. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Oh, sorry, we have one more that just popped up. Um, this is from David Gooden. Is there any account of Christian churches in Barbados apologizing for their part in the perpetuation of slavery? Um, very good question. Only today um, I was doing a bit of research and I would have read that in the United States, um, the Methodist church, they would have apologized um, for their role in enslavement. Um, as it pertains to these denominations in particular in Barbados, I must say that during the course of my research, I did not come across any evidence of such. Um, if it is out there, um, I probably haven't uh, come across it, but during the time that I was preparing for this lecture, I did not come across any evidence or any um, incidents of these churches uh, apologizing for their role in the enslavement of Barbadians. Okay, and we have a question from Andre World. Mr. Adams, do you think that these religion, religious institutions during that period would have chosen to go against the establishment, plantations, and other economic agents of that period? And what do you perceive would have been the result? Thank you for that question. Um, many historians have examined the nexus between church and state and economics and religion. Um, as we examine um, slavery in the Caribbean, we find that almost from the start, you have the established church walking um, side by side with the plantation owners or the plantocracy. Um, I would have mentioned in the lecture, for example, that the Anakin church was referred to as the planters church. Why? Because the planters would have donated property on which the churches would be being built. They would have donated funds um, to build the church, etc. And as it relates to the church supporting the plantocracy, that was usually what would have occurred in Barbados and other Caribbean um, territories. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question, please? Okay, the second part is what do you perceive would have been the result? Oh, well, if we take a look at how the established church and how the local planter class reacted to the missionaries who they perceived to be um, promoting emancipation or promoting anti-slavery um, uh, propaganda, um, it's a possibility that they would have reacted um, forcefully. And I can say the example of what would happen to Reverend Shrewsbury and the church that would have been destroyed in Barbados. Um, when these powerful elites felt that their way of life was being threatened in some way, they usually reacted um, in some manner. 
Okay, we have a question from Antoinette Williams. The Bible advises that the law of the land should always be upheld. Therefore, slavery, as it was the bedrock of the society, could not have been construed as unchristian or Christian back then. The treatment of slaves perhaps could be determined Christian or non-Christian, but the practice itself of owning slaves in a society that slavery forms its foundation is another topic altogether, isn't it? Um, I'm not getting the full gist of the question. Um, can you can I repeat? I'm repeat it? not getting the full gist of the question. Okay. Um, I okay, so from the top, the Bible advises that the law of the land should always be upheld. Mm -hmm. Therefore, slavery as it was a bedrock of the society could not have been construed as unchristian or Christian back then. The treatment of slaves perhaps could determine Christian or non-Christian, but the practice itself of owning slaves in a society that slaves form its foundation is another topic altogether. Isn't okay, it? well, um, if you are examining the topic from a theological perspective, there are scriptures in the Bible with some Christians have interpreted as supportive of slavery. And on, on, on the other hand, there are other scriptures which Christians have also interpreted to be anti-slavery. So almost from the beginning of the slave trade and um, enslavement in Barbados and the Caribbean, there were discussions amongst Christians um, Obviously, um, for the vast majority of the period of enslavement, uh, many Christians did support slavery and used biblical passages to you know, su support enslavement. However, there were Quakers, there were Moravians, there were Methodists, there were Baptists, there were Presbyterians who also used the Bible, the Golden Rule, for example, to argue that enslavement was wrong. So, in many instances, it would have um, boiled down to the interpretation of the Bible. Okay, we have one last question from David Gibbs on Facebook. He asks, what was the relationship between the Moravian and the Methodist on one hand and the Anglican Church? There was hostility um, between the Anglican Church and these new faiths. Um, principally because the Anglican Church was the church of the establishment, um, the planter merchant elite. Um, they would have been prominent in the Anglican Church and uh, they would have seen these new missionaries, these new denominations um, as, a, a, as a threat in some instances. So I would say that there was antagonism between the Anglican Church and the Methodists and Moravians. However, there were instances where there were interrelationships with some Anglican priests, etc., cetera, um, extended an olive branch to members of the Moravian church and the Methodist church. But if you take a look at the society, the socio-political construct in Barbados, um, the established church was the Anglican church. Um, they tended to be pro-slavery the um, congregants of those churches tended to be persons who uh, would have earned their living or who had connections to slavery, while the Methodists and Moravians, they uh, were perceived as being anti-slavery. So there would have been some um, level of tension um, between those denominations during the pre-slavery, um, pre-emancipation era. Okay, thank you, Mr. Adams, for answering all those questions for our um, attendees. Um, Mr. Kavabach, do you want to go ahead and just sum up everything for us? Okay, I, um, I can I ask just two questions? I don't know if I'll be so presumptuous. Sure, go ahead. Um, were, were there any evidence at all of um, anti-slavery sentiment in the Anglican Church at all? There, there were no you could not find any evidence of one or two priests who had a second thought 
yes, um, the same reverend that I referred to earlier in um, St. Lucy, um, he actually, um, in terms of his um, sermons, etc., he was accused of being anti-slavery. And also you had um, a shift in England um, at the time, some of the prominent Anglican clergy in England mm -hmm. started to adopt elements of um, anti-slavery um, theology, et cetera, and the sentiment because humanitarianism was um, increasing in England, especially in the late 18th century um, and going into the early 19th century. And when that occurred, there was some softening um, amongst the Anglicans in Barbados by some of the um, leading clerics who were here. Um, even though your conclusion was that um, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the uh, emancipatory so-called religions actually owned slaves, et cetera, and, uh, and operated in an anti-slavery manner in many cases, uh, would you though still see them as um, stepping stones towards eventual, eventual abolition? Um, there are some uh, many redeeming qualities that you can glean when you examine these faiths. Um, in terms of education, that would be one example. Um, they laid the groundwork in terms of um, the educational system in Barbados, the Methodists, the Moravians, the Anglicans, of course. And especially um, after the amelioration proposals would have been implemented in 1823, um, some of these churches um, increasingly um, proselytized and evangelized and Christianized enslaved Africans. Um, in terms of them harping on morality, et cetera, um, you can say that they encourage marriage uh, amongst the enslaved. They were very um, strict on that. And also um, they tried their best to, I guess the word that they would have used is civilize these enslaved persons uh, by giving them certain moral groundings based on biblical teachings. So there were some redeeming factors um, if you take a look at it from a universal perspective. I don't have to, uh, are there any other questions that popped up during that conversation we had? If so. Um, or if, if so again. One last question that came up. Um, at what point did these churches become anti-slavery? Well, if you take a look at the churches um, in England at the time, and you take a look at the Methodist church in, in England, you take a look at the Moravian church in Germany and so on. Um, they, their leadership were, um, became heavily involved in the emancipation movement in Britain. And when that shift occurred, um, some of the missionaries obviously would have um, followed the, the lead, so to speak, of the church um, back home. Um, as it relates to the Quakers, um, what would have happened is that in the United States, uh, many of the, the Quakers in, in Pennsylvania and other areas, they eventually um, shifted towards uh, uh, an emancipatory stance. Um, anti-slavery and uh, that um, soon became something that spread across um, Quaker communities um, in the Caribbean etc but in terms of when they started you have to take a look at the emancipation movement in Britain and how that snowballed how that developed and then the churches or the missions in the Caribbean they would have followed the lead in many ways of the churches um, in Europe, the home church in Europe. 
That's it. That's it. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and wrap up now. Okay. All right. Um, I I was a bit presumptuous <laughs> or previous when I um at, at the end of your lecture as we were waiting for um questions and elucidations and um so i repeat some of the things i said which i still believe that i i commend you for the level and the um of research that you did um it was quite wide and deep there were several persons who you mentioned who we are fam well familiar with of as um historians of note and, and beckles and williams and people like that um i thought it was well presented as they said it was clear and articulate so we understood clearly what you were saying. You must do fairly well in your form room with respect to that. The students can complain that they didn't understand what you were saying. Um, and uh, coming on to the end, though, I must say, it may have upset a few of us. Um, and it certainly showed me a different perspective on what I perceive to be the case. I think I will have to do a little research myself and not to double check you, sir, but just to um, further educate myself, I think there's a book on Al Gill that I plan to buy just to listen um, to, uh, to what it says. I, I'm glad, however, that your um, uh, conclusions or your discovery did not preclude, preclude you from becoming a member of the Anglican Church and a sitting on the, uh, the secretary to the council. So that, that must have been an interesting conundrum. Um, going forward, although I guess the churches are all a little bit different now. Um, I, I don't know if you would have educated your Anglican um, friends as to where you've come from, where you are now, that, that maybe could be an interesting discussion. So I just want to thank you, sir, um, and for a really scintillating um, uh, presentation. I, I hope you hear more from you while we are another going forward. And um, your and, and the questions answered, you were able to back comprehensively, um, such as to, um, I believe, answer in a way that people understood and, and clarified what cloud we may have. So I just want to say thank you very much um, for your presentation, the time, and effort, and energy that it took to um, to um, bring it forward, and also on behalf of the I don't know if I can speak on behalf of the museum, those who came participating, especially those who asked questions. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us. And I want to say um, we, we have looked at the Anglicans, the Catholics, the Jews, now the emancipation religions. And I think the next one um, about, about this time at this station uh, in this place would be the entry of North American churches um, into um, into the region, and that should be interesting. I entreat you all, I certainly will be there to listen. Um, I, I don't have to chair it, thank goodness. Um, but that would be done by uh, Dr. Pedro Welch. So that should be pretty interesting going forward. So once again, thank you very much. And um, I then pass the business back over to the Barbados Museum Historical Society. Thank you, Mr. Kambach. And as he was saying, um, we're going to have our next lecture next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Um, and you can use the same webinar ID and have so that you will be for today's lecture. Um, thank you all again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week.